the basic idea that I want to get across is that useful knowledge is knowledge that's well structured. You can access it when you need it. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the internet, relatively recent picture of the internet. So the idea here is that the core are all the different uh, international switches. They transfer the data from around the country or across the world. Further out are the next level service providers. And so maybe here in the green, you've got Sunlink, AT&T. And then further out, you get to the universities and the businesses and where the light purple print, or dark purple fringe around the outside. If you need to get to somewhere from somewhere else, you just need to know what they have in common, perhaps. Come in, come back out. Or if it's relatively close to something that you already know about, you can just hop directly there. So, uh, in this sense, our memory and our knowledge is all this interconnected web of information. So what sets us apart as experts, where we have this nice structured uh, knowledge versus our students, the novices. So Nikki says that uh, the most important difference is that we have this structured knowledge, and it's structured around the foundational principles. We've got these central core that we can go into and come out as we need. And rather than focusing on the surface features, we rely on the deep knowledge and how it fits into the big picture. So if it's not quite what we need, we can bounce around to what we do need. Novices see what's there. We see what's not there. And because of our structure, we can do things like add new information quickly. We can see the big picture. What general location does this information need to get to? Insert it there. And think about some more. We connect those links to other places in our knowledge. We can search more efficiently. We know where things generally are. We can recognize patterns that suggest solutions to the problem. And we can use information flexibly, because it's not exactly tied to a given situation. It could be close. So that leads us to, uh, well, what do we want our students to do? There's a couple of areas of expertise that we should mention at this point. Routine versus adaptive expertise. I'd expect my freshman level students to have a routine expertise at the end of the semester. So I'm thinking like a first level tech support person. You call them, they can tell you to turn your computer on. You know, they have a certain limited range of things they can help you with, but they do it all the time and they do it well and they're starting to piece some of the things together. So it's a more restricted knowledge base and there are certain algorithms that they just do. We want them over time, say as our majors, as they get to juniors and seniors, and expectations of the faculty is to have adaptive expertise, a much broader knowledge base, and we can access different connections to be creative in our problem solving. So how can we communicate the structure that we have. See, we have the structure and we have the knowledge itself. Just having the knowledge isn't enough. Having the structure. Here are some ways. One with verbal cues. So just while you're talking, you emphasize the structure. First, second, third. Groups those things together in a sort of order or just connection. This, on the other hand, that a compare-contrast relationship. And the students you know, pick up on that. And we normally do this anyway, right? Just because of our logical structure that we've got on it, we'll just naturally say these things. Advanced organizers, previewing ahead of time what you're going to be talking about later. So, okay, so well, today we're going to do this, this, and this. So that gives them a framework to know what else you're going to do. I like the idea of a story grammar and text structure. So in a literature class, you know how a general piece of fiction will, act, will, will go. You start with the characters and the situation, then you complicate the story, then you get to a climax, and it's resolved and you know, falling action. Well, even in math, we have this story. So what is the math story? We introduce a new concept, we do some basic examples, we try to deepen them a little bit, and then we go on to applications. So, when the students are in that cycle, they just understand what the process is. It helps them chunk it, put it together really can use it better. Uh, we can help them by providing some visual aids, graphic organizers like a concept map. Uh, 
glad Robert Payne is here today because we're doing some of this in our, uh, I would say remedial, but developmental math courses, trying to get them to visualize the structure of the data that they're doing, information they're doing. Then just comparative organizers like pro con lists, uh, similarities and dissimilarities, metaphors, analogies, and visualizations. I started off with one of those, thinking of knowledge as like the internet. How do you get around your knowledge? How can you get around to the piece you need? Um, but also, say, in a biology class where we refer to the circulatory system is like a highway network. It transports what your body needs around to your body. Just like a highway network transports all sorts of various freight around. And then just sequencing, how you structure the class in the first place. It helps you put this framework to where they Sometimes that's a little bit too uh, restrictive on them. Well, they'll remember the chapter or the section where it was done and can't connect it with others. But we can uh, correct that later, perhaps. But at least it gets some sort of organization in their mind. So here's a concept map I did for my recap class early in the semester on the idea of circles. So you got the picture, and then you've got the general form equation, which is so far removed from what a circle means in a sense. And so I connected the equations versus the idea of the information, the center and radius versus the drawing, and the two forms, and then how you travel between those pieces of information. So the students said they thought it was it made things clearer for them. So it worked pretty well. So one of the ways uh, to communicate all this structure is, well, we've got to unpack it for them because we can dance around in our knowledge pretty easily among all these connections, but how are they gonna learn that unless we are good models, for example? So if we're conscious of the processes that we perform at lightning speed as an expert, if we verbalize our decision-making processes and we model the solutions, then perhaps they will pick up on the structure as well. And I try to do that all the time. And my primary example here is yeah, quadratic equations. <laughs> so, crystal clear. Crystal clear. So we got our routine expertise. We want them to see this and go, wait a minute, I can set it equal to zero factor and solve. It is a zero product property. So when I look at this as an expert, I look at that first equation and say, there's no calculus there, there's no exponents, there's no logs, there's no higher power of x. All I see is an x squared, a constant, and a linear term. Okay. So that means it's quadratic, so I shift into my brain into the quadratic area, and I remember this outline that I've done so many times, how do you solve a quadratic equation, four different ways of solution. Okay, it's got an x, so that eliminates a couple of them. So I'm either gonna factor or use quadratic formula. Either way I do that, I have to solve for zero, and okay, so all that. You would expect your students to put that on their paper, right? Look how much knowledge is left out. All that stuff I just kept kept saying. Um, so how can we improve this if this is what's written on the board? Well, you could put little reminder notes on each step. What exactly were we doing on each step? What were you thinking? And maybe they'll remember what you say. Maybe not. My advisor's advice, my uh, uh, doctoral dissertation advisor said, in a math class, write down everything you say, because that's all they're going to write anyway. So if you want to get some explanation across, you should put it on the board. Well, that's pretty impractical at times, but you know, if you're careful with it, it will help. So an adaptive, uh, or sorry, a routine expertise student should be able to solve these. Now what if we want to solve something a little bit more creative? So here's a fourth power equation. And it basically is solved in a similar way. You factor, set the factors equal to zero and solve, keep going. But if you put this on your test and gave partial credit, most of them aren't going to get from this step to this step. If they could get to this step, they could get the rest. So it's almost an all or nothing. How do we help them get from this step to this step to recognize that, well, that's not a quadratic, but we could do the same sort of things? Well, that's again where the expert comes in. Now, we've got some perceptive students who might 
Well, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, so I could just try it. But how many of your students would think, just try the answer? Um, so one of the ways I explain it, oh, there's a trick. We can treat it just the same. Notice, here's a trick. We've got a toolbox of tricks you can use. Here's a trick. Just to help them to lodge that in their brain at a certain, uh, certain point where they can connect and maybe keep a list of toolbox tools as they go along in the semester. That you can just factor that. 